it's a, just a beautiful place to live. This is the southern tip of the island where there's a lighthouse. It's bounded by these incredible rocky coastlines. Um, but the village part of the island is really, essentially, it was just a uh, one drag from what's called West Ferry over to East Ferry. And the ferries would come in at West Ferry, mm -hmm. people would get on the Gitneys, would ride over to East Ferry and get on another ferry over to Newport. And um, it, for a while it had its own heyday and all of the waterfront on the right was big hotels, much in the way of kind of Atlantic City or um, Ocean Beach, Maryland, or something like that. Um, but the yellow pin is, is my site, uh, the site of our house. And it's a, as you can tell from the grid, you guys know it's a, a very tight little walkable community. It's just really, it's, it's just been heaven to raise kids here. And there are about 4,200 people on the whole island. Um, and we had built a summer house here with my in-laws, which is just around the corner. And what, then we decided, look, we need our own house and we need to be here full time. So that's the, the house that we bought, which um, one block up, and one block over was the family house. And so it took us two years to find this because the search radius was about 600 yards. We needed to stay near the family house. So that's why we put it here. And this is what it looks like. It was a, a classic little um, England, um, where Jamestown bungalow badly abused with pink paint and light blue transite, which is the asbestos side. And, side. and um, it's like a lot of these things that are built in New England where it was completely, I mean, completely built from the ground level and no two sticks are the same. So you were just going to do what it looked like when you got it. You had no architectural charm left or character anywhere. So what we decided to do was essentially take a thousand square foot bungalow and, and double it in size. Um, it's, a, it's a little on the, on the two main living areas. It's over 2,000 feet. What's in yellow is what we added, and what's in gray and white is, is what remained. Um, this was the first shoot of the episode where I got my, my children um, in the first episode. That's the only episode they watched. They didn't care about anything that they wanted into, and so they watched the episode with them. But you can see in this image what the existing um, house looked like. You can just look at the, the, the siding over here on the cheating on there. It's every Pieces of salvage from somewhere else. But herein lies the, the interesting thing from a technical point of view. The, the story that we pitched to this old house was that we wanted to take a hundred year old bungalow and we wanted to double it in size and make the whole thing net zero. And I know you all know that term, but um, uh, just that it produces as much energy as it uses over the course of a year. It runs in the, in the red during the winter and it runs in the black during the summer and together it, it should net out to about zero. Um, but we were combining two, almost two equal halves, one completely new construction and one renovation. And as anyone who's done any of this kind of work knows, the, the air sealing is the lion's share of the effort that you have to do. And when you're dealing with an old structure like this, it's really difficult, but there was a secret bullet that I'll show you about later. Um, so one of the things we, we did is as we extended this house, we wrapped the whole thing in uh, zip R12, which is essentially two inches of urethane foam and integrated sheathing. Um, <clears throat> that was after we had wrapped the house in another air barrier at the uh, line of the first sheathing and the existing sheathing. And the whole attempt was to kind of essentially create an airtight box um, around the house that, that included having triple glazed windows that got, um, for those of you who are dealing this stuff, it was less than 0.2 U value, which is pretty good. They're better windows, but that's pretty good. Um, so the, the process of it was there are all these sort of still photos because this old house is wandering around the whole time when they're not filming bits, they're, they're taking stills for the magazine. So we have a pretty well, good documentation of what happened over the course of this. Um, uh, the other thing, that, and this is sort of the personal part of it, which um, is that this came at a time for me when, when I was just so burnt out with the office. I mean, I was really exhausted, as I'm sure some of you uh, know that feeling. And, and when this opportunity presented it to, I had the 
good fortune in having a partner. And I went to him and I said, Douglas, look, I really want to do this. And I don't want to just stop in every week to see the construction. I want to, I want to do it with these guys. And he, being the great guy he is, said, go build this thing. Come in for any important meeting, but otherwise I've got the helm. And that was just an amazing thing. For about six months, I was in the office you know, a day or two a week, but mostly on site building with these guys. And it was, for those of you who've been in practice for a while and who may have gotten a bigger firm than you want, the return to being on site and, and designing and building and being right there with the architecture as opposed to managing invoices and, and personnel. And it was just a real shot in the arm for me. Um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't go this personal with any other group, but I figure a lot of you guys can, can um, sympathize with that. Um, and the other great thing about it for me was that <clears throat> this was, I did this, we started this project with a skeleton set of drawings just to get everybody started. And then I essentially designed this thing on the way. And every night I would show up on site and they, the guys would leave me notes about questions they had. And I would go back and that night and the next morning I would sketch out details and come back and drop them off at about eight o'clock. And um, so it was this really, it was going back to architecture school of being hands-on designing every single detail. And I'll show you some of those later, but, um, and then there's the whole this old house factor. This is, for any of you who've watched the show, you probably recognize this guy. This is Richard Trithui, who's the, the HVAC and plumbing specialist. And, and a lot of the construction was organized around episodes and what they wanted to show. And in this one image right here, he was demonstrating the technology of the energy recovery ventilator and how the cold air coming in crosses with the warm air going out and the heat is changed. So it was interesting to see how they would, um, you know, very often in the beginning, they would have me on screen and ask me to describe something and I would slide into my architect speak or, or professional jargon and they would have to back it up and say, no, 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 we're going to take this down to regular people words. And so one of the objectives for me of this and one of the reasons I wanted to do it is I really felt as part of our mission it would be a great idea to, to, to demonstrate that um, zero energy housing didn't have to look like zero energy housing. It could be completely transparent to a historic neighborhood. And, and I thought if we could demystify it for enough people, it might get more people interested in doing it other than the aficionados and the energy geeks that, that are willing to, to do it. So, this sort of thing, having the show and having these set of um, demonstrations all along the way forced me to, to be able to explain it on screen or, um, or help explain it on screen. And it was a great exercise. I found, um, I found these guys to be absolutely as delightful in person as they appear on screen. Um, I was gonna point out that in this image, I said about how air sealing when you're trying to achieve net zero is really probably the hardest thing and one of the biggest factors in, in getting energy usage down, that air exfiltration through the house. Well, typically that's done with just an absolute rigorous maniacal sealing all along the way of every plate and rim joist and, um, and having to track all those down and then doing smoke tests to find the leaks. Well, some of you may be aware there was a product on the market for years called AeroSeal, which was used to seal uh, HVAC ductwork. And basically what it would do is it aerosol, aerosolized an acrylic and then flew it under pressure into ductwork and it would find the leaks and, and essentially build up and seal that leak. Well, they developed a technology that they could do it in the whole house uh, application. And so this is the, the application. They're looking at the computer, which is uh, attached to the blower door test, and they're, they're measuring the, the effect of the ceiling as it's going on. So inside the house, there are um, two or three of these tripods with these nozzles spraying aerosol into the, into the interior atmosphere, which is pressurized, and that's finding all the leaks. And so we stood there and watched the pressure meter on the 
on the laptop there go from you know four or five air changes per hour down to 0.6 or 0.7 air changes per hour and just as this was um, ceiling and, and the demonstration they did for the television was they put a piece of window screen over the an empty uh, door boring for the for the hardware and over the course of, of an hour that window screen which was covering a three inch hole completely occluded with this stuff and sealed up completely so it's a really great technology it's it's approved um, by whatever the organizations that approve indoor air quality as, as not not being at all toxic, but I thought that was interesting. Another um, feature was because you're trying to air seal, things like exposed raptor tails are places where it's very difficult to seal all around those things. So we created the simplest box we could and then applied to it these decorative um, raptor tails. And as I said, one of my objectives was to try and make um, a very traditional looking house but that performed absolutely as, as well as you could do it in the 21st century. And so you resort to things like this. I, I, it's, you should never read the comment section on a TV show house because there were so many self-appointed priests of construction condemning me to, to uh, a, a eternity of brimstone because we had fake rafter tails. I was really surprised that in the lay world that many people would notice that or care. But, a lot of people did. Um, so here it is. That's Tom Silva, who's the kind of patriarch of this old house, um, installing those rafter tails on the front. Um, as I said, these guys are, are really fun to be around. We, they would come down, and, and many of you know this already, but 15 minutes of footage would take 8 to 12 hours of, of filming. And so these were long, long days of and it looks very casual on screen, like you're just talking and discussing, but every shot you do four or five times from four or five, so you have to eventually remember the script and do it the same five times. So interesting thing. Um, as I said, there was a lot of sketching that went on on the fly. Um, this was a sketch for, we suddenly realized we had access to a CNC cutter. And so we designed these decorative skirt panels um, in MBO panels. I, I sketched out and we built one episode. We built this, Tommy and I built this console from some salvage dope that I got up in Boston. Um, this is just a collage of all of those sort of early morning sketches that I left to them. And like I said, for me, this, was, this is what I always wanted to be as an architect. And it was such a shot in the arm just to be working with guys that were really good, that really cared and had great um, ideas. And so just as we went, I sketched everything long and gave it to them at the appropriate times. So it was a um, really fun process for me. Um, so I'll, I'll go now to just some images of the finished house. Basically the existing house is, goes everything to the left of that dryer vent you can see up in the panel in the dormer. Um, everything to the left was original more or less and everything to the right was new. And the idea was just to kind of extrude the ridge line and, and keep it all very low slung. Um, we did, I did allow myself something which I don't normally do. I'm not really, um, I, I'm fairly traditional in my um, architectural language, but I sort of let this thing flex a little bit in another direction. Um, this is it under construction. This is it from the backyard. On the right, you can see the barn, which was designed in place specifically to provide enough solar uh, photovoltaics to meet our need. And it's essentially a six um, KW system. Um, and I would say that, to be honest, we're not hitting that zero. We're probably at 75%. But I have two kids who have never learned how to turn off a light switch. So um, that doesn't help. Um, these are some shots of the interior. Maybe you recognize some of it from the detail. Um, this is the upstairs hall. I have a, you know, a general philosophy that I always tap around the office that no space can only do one thing. Every, you can't just have a hallway to doorways. That hallway's got to, so I don't call this the hallway, you call it the library. Um, this is my son, Theo's room. Um, my son, uh, 
Nate, I'll show, oh, actually, I want to show you, go back to the ground floor plan for a minute and see if you can see it. On the right, I think you can see it if you're not, a, if you're not obscured by everybody's images. There's a piano on the right, and that sits in a little dedicated nook that we call the piano nook. And the whole house is really designed around Nate's piano because he's a very talented musician and we wanted to have him practicing with us, but not right in the middle of the living room. But as a, as a consequence of getting that to him, we had to build a secret room for Theo, which is the little room off to the right, which I, is, this was, eventually we'll have a little secret book, bookcase that opens with a secret button. But um, even with just the curtains, Theo loves to get in there and read and play Lego, um, the master bedroom. This is a look back at the barn and the, and the, we, I splurged on three quarter inch, but uh, we saw on red cedar um, shingles. Uh, but at the last minute I had this, the, I don't know why it took me the last minute to figure it out, but yeah, I really didn't need to spend that much money on red cedar shingles underneath these photovoltaics. So we just outlined the roof in the red cedar and underneath there is three tab flat black asphalt. So it just worked out. And the other thing it did is that because of the depth of the shingles, it sort of sets the panels in closer to the roof. And I've always objected to the way photovoltaics look. They always look unintentional, like they were put up on a roof by somebody who didn't care. So one of my intents was to sort of knit this thing in and make it feel both in color and design as if it belonged as part of the house. Um, this is now, doesn't look anything like this because it's filled with my woodworking shop, but it is a really wonderful barn. And that's the, the guest suite on the second floor, um, which essentially while the skilled carpenters were in the house building the good stuff, I was essentially building this barn, um, not all by myself. But anyway, that's, that's the net zero. Building your own house, especially at this point in my career, was such a shot in my arm and giving myself the time to really spend on it as a way, it, it really, I think, saved, I don't know, it's too extreme to say it saved my career, but it certainly gave me energy to get back into the office and, and do good work there because I was really burnt out and taking every chance I could to escape. And, and so any of you who are at that point in your career and um, I think you got to walk away if you're able to, just to get the mojo back. Um, so I wanted to show just because this is show and tell a couple of other projects that I'm kind of proud of recently that are coming out of the ground right now. One is the Hammett's Wharf Hotel in Newport. Um, this is the waterfront in Newport. Anybody who's been there, you might know that this main drag, which is labeled 138A, is America's Cup Ave. That's the main drag by the waterfront in Newport. And it hangs a left and heads up the hill towards all the mansions and the International Tennis Hall of Fame. And right where that uh, tag is, <clears throat> was a site that our clients um, bought and intended to put a new hotel on. If you think your historic district commission is, is rabid, you don't know, you've never been to Newport. This is the most rabid of the rabid historic district commission. So we really went into this thinking it was a long shot that we were going to get anything approved. This is the that view. Unfortunately, the, the, the road geometries here are really too, too large for the pedestrian environment it is. So what you see is, in fact, it's sort of a high velocity curve right here, which is unfortunate, but we hoped we could do something better. So um, <clears throat> our design, this is one of the early sketches of it um, in the background is a, uh, an original sort of waterfront mercantile building that is now a hotel. And this is the, our, our version sitting next to it. Um, I'll just go to the plan for a second. So you can see um, in this image, the, our proposed building takes the form of, of two, uh, an L and a wing connected by a sort of breezeway or, or bridge. And really the whole thing is intending to frame an outdoor space that's looking out to the harbor. Um, because of the floodplain, it's all up about above 16 feet um, flood elevation. So every the parking is all handled underneath. And strangely, so is the entrance 
you know, the main vehicular entrance, you come in and drive around under the building. There is a, uh, a pedestrian egg entrance as well, but when you're arriving at the building, it's a little bit subterranean. So this is the plan This shows the, the ground floor level on the left, which is in the floodplain, and the upper terrace level, which addresses um, America's Cup Boulevard. Um, everything on the, on the upper side of the plan on the right is the hotel lobby and functions, and the lower part of the plan is a independent um, restaurant and retail. <clears throat> the rooms, are, these are what they, what they euphemistically call in the um, hotel business now sort of micro rooms, and they're really small. Like you, would, you would be shocked if you saw it when it, when it was framed. Um, they look much better in reality, but uh, we've got 88 um, rooms in here of an average of like 230 square feet. Um, these are the, the detail and the, the design of those spaces obviously comes down to the half an inch scale to make sure everything works. Um, uh, this is a little more detailed rendering. You can see this language of in this location, there's a the history is of these sort of masonry civic buildings like the post office, which is across the street, combined with these historic waterfront um, mercantile storage and, and boat building facilities. So it shows this language of, of masonry connected by um, lap sliding. Um, so at the public base, it's masonry. And on the sides, it goes to lap siding. I'll show an image of that. This is the hotel lobby. This is actually a rendering. We're not quite finished, but it's looking very close to this. This is the hotel living room. Um, one of the micro rooms, and one of the ways you do that is you bring the sink out of the, the bath area and you um, just make snug everything up to the furniture. And this is the, you know, the big reveal of the, the deck out the back, which we one of our big arguments to the client and, and what I think our big success is, is that this hotel really needed to be public. It couldn't be a private sanctuary only for the guests and that the, the city didn't want it to be that and we didn't think it was good for the hotel itself. So this is a fully public um, a raised deck that looks out at the, to the west with a restaurant on one side and the hotel bar on the other side and and we're really looking forward to this thing opening. Um, that's a, the site itself just under construction. This is how it stands um, as of a couple of weeks ago. The, the color scheme, everything that's woodwork was going to be this sort of slate gray to match the steel work. Um, but it's been, this client has been wonderful. The city has been really happy about it and we're very proud of it. So then I'm going to wrap up with one quick quick tour through um, another little project we've done. Some of you might have seen it. It won um, the NAHB Community of the Year and Green Community of the Year um, this year in uh, the BALA Awards. Um, the site is a place called, it's basically where that red dot is. And it's a, historically it was called Ropes Hill. And um, you can't really tell from this image, but there's a steep grade from where my cursor is down to Castle Street. And then historically there was a rope, it was called Rope Walk Hill. And there was a pathway that went down and it was so steep that you had ropes on either side to, to use as handrails that brought you down to an area called South Town, which was basically where all the shell fishermen came in off of Narragansett Bay. Um, <clears throat> so this is the view again, you can't really tell the grade unless you look off to the right. But you can see the views you're sneaking off to the harbor over here. And equally interesting, looking off to the left here, is a view back up the hill to the main street of the town. And the town is organized in what's called hill and harbor. And, and main street is the kind of uh, vertically midway between the hill where all the rich people live. And then there's main street. And then there was the harbor where all the working class live. And we're right in the middle of the harbor. Um, so we took the top of that hill and turned it into this little um, cottage court of nine units, primarily duplexes in one single with common parking on the side. Um, the real, the big move was this, what we sort of call the Spanish steps coming up from Castle Street in a tiered way that get, drops you off at the various 
uh, front doors and get you up to the level of the common court. Um, this is a view once you're up in the common court looking back at what I've been calling the Spanish steps. Um, and that's a view of what we intended or what we represented to the town. The view, the public face from Castle Street would be. And these two duplexes that face in and out around this kind of grand stair that takes you from the bottom of Castle Street up to the top of the hill. That was the rendering we produced in the, um, for the hearing. Um, and then this is what it looks like today, which uh, um, is an interesting sidebar that the, the developer that approved, hired us and approved this ended up selling the approval to this young developer who is the son of the most notoriously bad developer in the state. And he was determined to retrieve the family name and make his mark as a as next generation developer. So he proceeded to spend way more money on every aspect of this than he ever should have. Um, and it garnered him the, the, the platinum award, but it left him unable to sell these things for anything like what he needed to do to make um, his nut pack. So he's right now over a barrel trying to finish the project, but what he's built is relatively beautiful. So for that moment, um, so this is a view, an aerial showing. We're missing, he's under, got the last three units under construction right now. Those, those will be across here and sort of closing the courtyard. But you can see its relationship to Greenwich Harbor in the background. Um, it's a really wonderful place. And um, it's, you know, he would have sold out if he were selling them for 75,000 to 100 less. Um, this is, one of the things he did is he took our, we had a very simple and I thought gracious landscape plan. And he decided that there was no landscape element that would be a bridge too far for this thing. So we built that masonry kitchen fireplace thing. He hired a landscape architect who I actually liked, who did what I think is a, a very expensive pitch and putt in the, in the courtyard here. He put, this makes it actually look as, this is the best view of it. You can see the, the kind of hokey, uh, pilings with the ropes around them and the, there's a there are all sorts of rose compasses in the pavement and there's um, weird he took weird detention areas and made them conversation pits and it's it just broke my heart but it just goes to show what a snob I am because people love it they absolutely love this so on the right is that kitchen there um, and he did a fair he did a decent job with the with the architecture after the first two months of us threatening to walk off the job every other day because he wouldn't build according to our drawings. But um, the end result is his interiors are all his and his mother's doing. Um, and again, I think it's, they're exciting in a way I wouldn't do, but they, they work for his market. So um, that's my show and tell for, for you guys. Um, you're a tough audience, so I'm dreading your comments. Right. Yeah. So I'd be happy to answer any questions or accept any criticism. So Don, I have one one question: Is it in, yeah. is this is in East Greenwich or where? What town is this one in? Oh yeah, I'm sorry. It's in East Greenwich, Rhode Island. East Greenwich, okay. Rhode Island is a little okay. uh, Main Street town on on the old post road that comes from Maine all the way down to Florida on Route Route One. No, um, I, yeah. I know it. I know the other project you did there, I've seen. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's literally a stone's throw away from this one. Um, yeah. So, and East Greenwich used to be my hometown before we moved down here to East Greenwich. So, I know it well, and, and it mattered to me greatly how. So, Donna, I have a question for out. you. So, um, sure. I have a question for you about your house. Um, uh, which is, I guess, one that we all deal with at some point or another. Did you feel like you were sort of uh, in a busman's holiday situation working on your own house? Um, what, was it relaxing or was it slightly stressful to be, you know, doing, uh, doing work for yourself? Um, and, you know, and that your, maybe your income wasn't what it was otherwise. 
Well, that's where, you know, I said that really that's why I owe this incredible debt to my partner because he essentially took the wheel and um, defended me from any responsibility for six months. I mean, I had, I had my bigger projects and my bigger clients that I was um, overseeing the work on and I would be at the important meetings, but um, the, the answer is no, not at all. It was the most relaxing thing. And I don't think it would have been had I not had a, such a, a great builder to work with who was incredibly skillful and incredibly collaborative. You know, he wasn't, there are two types of builders I find. They're the types that are, that are either very defensive with the architect or they're overly solicitous. And they, you know, they say, whatever you say, whatever you say, and, and really what you're looking for is feedback, not necessarily complete um, obedience. And so he, he, was, he was confident enough to, to, to get to a point in the project and say, you don't want to do it this way. What about this way or this way? And if I said, no, I really do, he'd say, fine, let's do it. And if I said, well, what's your idea? And he would, you know, sketch it out and show me. And so it was, it was just collaborative and it felt like a real craft project, unlike a lot of ones where I'm just trying to mitigate the compromises everywhere. Uh, hey, uh, Don, can you stop uh, sharing your screen unless you want to go back and look at something? Yeah. Hold on a sec. So we can see everybody's faces. Uh. How's that? Outstanding. Yeah, and if Excellent. we need to go back, we can go back. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it was great builder, great collaboration at, at the perfect moment for me in my kind of professional life and, and emotional life. I know, you know, John Anderson talks so openly about his um, kind of mood struggles, and I was at that point. You know, I was really frustrated and, and dragging myself into the office, and um, I just realized I'd been for for 15 years, I'd been managing a architecture firm and hadn't been doing what I really love to do. And so. You know. So how's that going to change your practice moving forward, Don? Well, it's, it, that's a great question. What it really nicely did is it, it, it separated me from my previous role as a micromanager of too many details in a way that they, the firm figured it out. And then when I came back, there was no need to resume that. You know, I was ready to let go of all that. So now I, it's made me up much more to be more involved in design and the kind of the setting a project off on, its, on a good start. I, I really, I push back even to young designers that they need to establish the relationship with the client. And I'm, I am essentially uh, color commentary and, and backup and so I wouldn't, I wouldn't have had the, the um, self-discipline to get there if I hadn't just been sort of forced into it by, by uh, running out of steam. And so now I come back to the firm and Douglas, my partner, has assumed much more of the um, kind of functional day-to-day -day leadership of the firm. And I'm out getting new work and, and um, design review and design genesis for most of the projects. And the ones that I'm really interested in, I dive in deep, but I don't have to. I can kind of extract myself. So um, it's, been, it's been great for me. Terrific. Congratulations. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful, beautiful work. Can I ask a really dumb kind of technical question? Sure. OK. When you were talking about your house, you, you know, one of the issues I've often dealt with is, yeah, I've got my old portion and I'm building this new addition. And how do I get the old portion to stand up to um, the expectations of new construction? But of course, I'm also looking at this thing's lasted for 150 years. And I see houses that were built 10 years ago that have rotted out. So I'm not always sure which way that that should swing. But you mentioned that you had you put a, I guess what sounds like a vapor barrier on the house the old house, and then you, you did everything with zip over that. And one of the concerns that I've had people tell me is if I've got multiple barriers, I end up with the risk of trapping moisture in. Is there yeah, the, the, first, the first barrier was not a um, moisture barrier. It was an air permeable vapor barrier. 
So it's, cool. it's, it's something made by um, Grace called, in, in, uh, I can never remember the, the name of it, but for that, very much for that reason, we needed to have um, the, but I was frankly less concerned about that because I didn't want to do it, but we ended up using cell foam flashing the inside of the stud bays. And so that for our, in and of itself keeps a lot of the moisture migration from ever getting right. out into the second layer. Um, but uh, so one of the, th this is a, you may find it interesting. One of the pressures of working with this old house is that all these vendors and companies want to get their product highlighted on the show, even if it's not called out specifically because it's a not, not for profit. So come at you with what they say, we'll give you this for 50% off or we'll give you that for free. Well, and, and then this old house has their own agenda. They really want to get somebody, they want to sign them up as an advertiser. So they come to you and they pressure you and they say, hey, it would be really great for us if you use this closed cell phone guy. And I didn't really, you know, I, the original text called for, for um, uh, cellulose, stamp blown cellulose in the, the wall cavity. And I'm fully aware of the, the nastiness of some of the closed cell foams, but uh, it turns out my principles have a price tag. And when someone's willing to, <laughs> to give me free uh, insulation, I caved pretty quickly. Yeah, well, tell me about it. I did a uh, Property Brothers house. Oh, yeah. Awful, awful, awful experience. Absolutely the worst. Well, people warned me that this would be awful, and it wasn't. I, I yeah. loved every year. I think it's because I, I, we had done, we had designed three of the, of the, what do they call the idea houses. This old house builds a new house for the magazine, and they usually do it concurrently with the TV show house. So I already got the drill. I knew what, what crazy makers they were, and I was fully prepared to dive into that. Um, but one of the pressures is, you know, I, my budget was gone in the first two weeks and I don't regret it for a second. I don't think I ever would have built phase two in my mind if I hadn't done it, uh, basically because I was pressured to, but yeah. yeah, my, my kids, I'm, I'm steering them towards, um, a career in the trades as college is already been paid any other question? By the way, uh, Don, on that Hemet's Wharf, when you said that the, the city made the uh, deck area and viewing area public, um, that's full on public so that like if the homeless are there, they get to hang out there. How does that work? No, no, no. I mean, it's not the, and I, and the city didn't mandate, it was essentially an agreement of the approval that they would maintain a reasonable level of, of public access to that deck. That they couldn't close it for events, things like that. But, but yeah, no, it's not in an in a legal sense public, um, and you're not going to find the homeless people up there. Um, but they, you know, they're struggling mightily with that because the waterfront has always been privatized in Newport, and they're trying piece by piece to to knit together a series of public or quasi public. Um, walkways and it, there's something called the harbor walk that they're trying to force on to all the developers and and it's basically a condition of approval which is is good um, i have a question nathan um uh, good presentation don and great work as always so i'm gonna ask a, a kind of broader question so mm -hmm. how do you decide what the outside of your building should look like do you think that you have kind of a, a general theme to, you know, your projects as a, say, portfolio of projects? Or do you think that they sort of look differently and take on different characters based on the context, the local style, the client's budgets, the height limitations, all of that? Like, how do you decide what something should look like? I, I would like to think that it's the second version you did that we that we kind of go into it open minded and I've always said you know if the context supported it and the client wanted it I would be more modern than the biggest modernista you know I I, I have I'm very agnostic about I just think that traditional architecture tends to work so that's usually my starting point but um, yeah I think in that particular instance it was. 
I don't think we had a clear intention. We did probably 20 different versions of the elevation that went from everything from um, kind of uh, Queen Anne inspired to much more utilitarian. And as it started to, we started to get input and we started to better understand the site, it sort of settled into this thing that was using the, the mix of monumental buildings that were nearby and the more casual waterfront stuff historically that's in there. And I feel like it was the right, you know, I think I feel like we hit the right note with that. Um, if you're in the site at that particular moment, you realize that it, it needs to be more formal than some of the other casual waterfront stuff at that moment um, in the in the city plan. Um, but then as you move to the backside, it picks up a lot of the idiosyncratic working waterfront stuff. So I'd like to think that it was, it's totally us being um, open-minded to the, the context, primarily the context and the, what the community needs. You know, if the client, of course we, we try to, we, we're, the client is a big factor in it, but if a client told me in that location they wanted, um, you know, a Tadao Ando concrete and glass thing, that we wouldn't do it. Um, not because I have anything against that, I just have something against it in that location. And um, yeah, and, but I do think we, we try very hard to, to avoid a being recognizable stylistically. I don't think we're totally successful in that. I think most people can sort of tell if it's one of our buildings, but the theory is that we're style agnostic. We just do what works. And it just seems to be that traditional kit of parts is what works most times. Okay, thank you. I mean, I know that your, your, your office, I think at least taken on the macro has a similar philosophy because you've got a, a wide range of styles and product types and, and, and uh, um, I know your stuff tends to be much more um, traditionally aligned, but a lot of the other stuff that comes out of your office, it varies widely, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, I mean, that's why I asked the question. It's always interesting to hear the story behind why an architect decides what a building should look like, so. Yeah. Um, Don, if nobody else has a question, what, uh, what, What's the, what would you have done differently if you went back to that net zero house, recognizing that you're going to have all these chefs in the kitchen, essentially with you where you don't control your, you're living in this house now, right? Yeah. And so mm -hmm. this is a very personal thing to you. And yet you have all these other people telling you what to do. What would you do differently if you went through it uh, starting uh, now? Well, I have the virtue of this is the fourth house my wife and I have done together. We renovated, we renovated three houses and or two and built one essentially from a teardown to new. So we had two things. One, as a working relationship, we had dialed that in. That was how you save your marriage if you're going to do one of these things. We, you assign each person a realm of, of final veto, but you each have to put on the other one. So I had control, final control of everything that was built, constructed, or installed. And she had final veto of everything that was painted or placed or hung. And, and so we would have, you know, big arguments about what we would want to do. But at the end, she said, you know what, this is what I'm doing what, with regard to the interior furnishings and everything. And we'd argue about something else in the architecture. And I'd say, okay, you know, I've heard your piece and this is what we're doing. And we just accepted that from the beginning. So anyway, that's a little sidebar, but what I would do different in the d design, um, I'm sitting on a banquette right now that's an inch and a half too high. And it's really irritating. You know, get your banquette the right and, and the account for the cushion on top of that. Um, but I don't think that's really the question you're asking. I think um, it's it sounds trite, but I had so much time to spend on this that 
there was no, we didn't make any mistakes because if there was a mistake, I saw it immediately, took it out and did it over. And so the only thing I would do differently and that I, I'm a little chagrined about being that I'm a professional and should know better is I spent double my budget. <laughs> you know, I, it just got away from me and I just let it run. And I got, I got so excited at some point that I said, I'll, I'll pay the piper later. And, and all along thinking I was 25%, 30% over. And really, we just, we really screwed the pooch when it came to the, the, the budget. And um, as I said, ultimately with a little distance and now that I refinanced a couple of times and, I, and I'm in good shape, I'm, I'm not, I don't regret it. But at the time I was just thinking, how could you do something so stupid as to start a project that you don't have the money to finish? And, um, How does that compare with what you're doing for other people? How often are you spot on <laughs> with the budget? How often do they push for things and you end up going up with that number? Well, I'm so, I don't know, I'm so sensitive and I feel so much responsibility to their projects that I'm, I'm kind of a, a, a wet blanket the whole way. You know, every time they ask for something, I'm saying, that's outside of your budget. You know, you can't do that unless you change the budget. So they know before they get there that they're, they're pushing the budget up. Yeah. Um, so you didn't, have a Don Powers. you didn't have a Don Powers to tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. Also, I had this illusion of all this free stuff coming at me. You know, I kept thinking, you know, somebody would, would offer something that I didn't have in the budget. Like, for instance, um, we had a millwork company come and say they would, um, they would give us any beyond what we had in the plan, they'd give us any additional built-ins that we wanted for free. So, oh, holy shit, that could, that, that's a great deal. So I started redoing the plan and finding places for these built-ins and, and then it ended up being a, a, a huge number, but you have to pay tax on all that. Even if they give you the product, you pay tax on it as if it were income. So we ended up with this huge tax bill that I didn't see coming. And um, so just, yeah, I mean, we shouldn't, we're smart people, and but I, I just fell asleep at my own switch there. Yeah, I found when I'm doing spec and stuff, the only way I'll do it now, because I made the mistake so many times early on, I will only go into a deal with that if I have, even if we're not you know, really partners, I've got a guy who's the builder as my partner as the design guy. So he's there to tell me when I can have what I want and when I can't. And often it turns out to be a great, you know, symbiotic relationship because he'll say, well, what are you trying to achieve? And I'll explain what we're trying to do. And he'll say, what if you did it this way? Yeah. That's, you know, that works. So I've found that actually is a great learning tool. And Jeff, our, my, my builder, as great a builder as he was, he had the, the, you know, the cameras and the lights on him too. So he wanted to showcase everything that he could do. So you got this old house encouraging you to just go a little extra you have the builder who knows he's on national TV and he wants to build something beautiful. And there's nobody saying, hey, wait a second, slow down. You know, that's, that's got to cost some money. And, and when you're willfully putting your fingers in your ears and humming just to avoid the being aware of it, it's not a good scenario. Yep. Don, the house is beautiful. When you sit in it now... And um, and you look at all those places where you spent that extra money. Do you regret any of it? No, that's what that's the thing. You know, I do not regret it. I, oh. I honestly, I, I know myself well enough to know a lot of stuff. I had told myself, let's just put up a shell and and I'll I'll do phase two later. Phase two never would have happened. It never would have done it. And so I look around right now, and I'm just once the. Um, you know, like I said, once we swallowed the, I'm looking for a metaphor when I like a boa constrictor swallows a giant uh, animal. And once it's passed, I, I, I'm, I'm, we've dealt with it and I'm happy to be in the house. That's right. Could you, could you write it off as business development because that brought in so much new work? Well, it didn't for one, but um, because <laughs> frankly, the people that, and I didn't think it would directly primarily because we don't, we don't do a lot. We do two or three custom houses a year, and they're generally in the, um, you know, 1.5 to $2 million range. And 
the, that watch the Philip House, they're primarily kind of regular folk. We're not building two million dollar houses. So they would we got a lot of inquiries, but they'd want us to then design a screen porch or to to um, put in a dormer addition. And, and we're at this point we're just not set up to be able to do that. Yeah. So it didn't bring work, but it I it kind of had marketing value otherwise. But I wish I had thought of somehow writing off the expense. Thanks for telling me now, Gary. <laughs>